Yeah, doors are closing. Okay, great. I'm just gonna go. So I'm gonna start by saying that uh, biosensors are awesome. So you take uh, just a random human being, like this one with a bit more hair, you slap on a few uh, sensors and you've got data. So I think this is like a dream for data scientists, right? You can do all this data science and machine learning on your own personal biological uh, data. And I'm gonna show you uh, how to do that in this 30-minute uh, talk. So if you're a citizen data scientist like myself, and you like playing with uh, biosensors in your spare time, there are a bunch of them available on the market uh, for consumers. And these are ba basically the types you can easily uh, afford. There are uh, EEG sensors for measuring your brain waves. So you can actually measure your, your brain waves non-invasively and control uh, things with that. There are EMG sensors for measuring the electrical signals from your muscles. I'll be mostly talking about that. And also things you can easily do is like uh, measure heart rates. And there are also lots of other biosensors, but these are the ones I've uh, played with uh, mostly. So there's, of course, plenty of applications you can imagine uh, for biosensors. The first one, which is my specialty, is uh, bionics. So bionic arms, for example, they use these uh, muscle sensors uh, to control uh, the arms. Um, but there are also plenty of other cases, like in medical, you can imagine all kinds of diagnostic applications. In gaming, and especially in VR, big companies are really thinking about putting your head chock full of uh, biosensors and uh, measuring everything about you while you are uh, gaming. And there are also plenty of consumer, normal consumer applications, like um, uh, sensors to help you relax during meditation, but also sensors to help you uh, focus during uh, programming, for example. So plenty of things you can do uh, with these biosensors. And my own use case was mostly related to, to bionics. So a few years ago, we thought, let's uh, start helping people making more affordable bionic arms. And one of the things we invented was uh, the idea to make a, a learning environment where people could train their muscles in a more fun way uh, and have an AI also help them control uh, video games. Yeah, and then basically you can collect data while they're playing games. And you can also control by bionic limbs. And there are maybe some other advantages we came up with. Now, there were a bunch of technical obstacles. And this year, I personally redid the whole project uh, with new technology. So I'll be uh, talking about that. And one of them is, uh, is Julia. Another technology is solving another problem, which is this one. There, there are plenty of biosensors on the market. And if you buy a few and you want to quickly try them all out, it, ca it quickly gets complicated because all these biosensors, they have uh, a different interface, they work differently, uh, and then you they, wor they work on different operating systems. You want to apply in the end your code on different applications and different uh, environments. And, and this really slowed our project uh, down a lot. We had to, every biosensor we bought, we had to figure out again how it worked. Uh, but this has been solved also in the past years, I'm really happy to say. And this is an open source library it's called Brainflow. Uh, I'm also now a contributor, because I really love this uh, library. And it is trying to integrate all these biosensors in, in, in one package. It uh, runs on any operating system. And also what I really love is that uh, it has bindings to any programming language. So it, you can do it in Python, but I'll of course be doing it uh, in Julia. And then you can really focus just on you know, playing with your data instead of wrestling uh, with your device. So I really encourage anyone who wants to go in this area to, to look at BrainFlow. Now, and then you can say, okay, now I've got BrainFlow, I got my data. Which language do I actually want to use? Eh, you're free now. Now, I in my project, we use a lot of Python and C++. Eh, C++ for like, performance and Python if you just want to quickly uh, get your data. But from my point of view, I think C++ and, and Java, they are too much effort for me to write. And uh, yeah, I just want to quickly prototype things. And then Python and R, often actually they were too slow as a programming language if I built my own custom data signal processing. So I went for Julia this year. Yeah? I rebuilt the whole project from scratch uh, in Julia because it is indeed fast and I wanted to prove it was fast enough for my use case. And there's plenty of uh, data science you can do with it and I'll, uh, I'll briefly show you as well. So we're gonna just get going. Uh, the first thing you do before you do machine learning is uh, looking at all the data. Uh, now the First, you need to get the data. And in BrainFlow, actually, it's very simple. They have the same interface in uh, roughly every programming language. You just uh, use the package, you install it, you start, let's see, you, uh, you choose your, your board. So I, I use here the GeForce Pro board. It's one of the sensors you'll show, see you later. Uh, you can input parameters, but it's often not necessary. Then you start up this object here, 
Uh, okay, and then the cool stuff happens. You turn, you make sure your sensor is turned on. Okay, uh, then you prepare the session. It makes the connection for you. So in any programming language, you can do it. So it's all the same. Then you start your stream. Then you just get your data. Then you do stuff. I'll show you the stuff later. And if you're done, you you stop the stream and you you disconnect uh, the device by releasing the session. And that's it. And you can do this for any device in any programming language. Okay, I really I really like this. And then, uh, okay, if you get the data, you want to plot. Now, in Python, you probably all have your favorite plotting package. In Julia, if you're new to Julia, you have to first uh, find your way around again. So I looked at all the plotting packages uh, in Julia, and the, the actually, they seem to be converging mostly on the plots package. So if you want to get started in Julia with plotting, I would say take a look at the plots package, uh, because it's really integrating all the, the backends. So you can switch uh, backends very easily between PyPlot and Plotly and GNU plot and whatever you prefer, uh, with, again, the same interface. There are also a few others still that I looked at. There is um, Vega Lite, for example. It's like a grammar of graphics uh, language, and they just made a wrapper for it. So if you like ggplot in R, then this is maybe your first starting point. And there's one other language that's still competing a bit with the plots ecosystem. It is uh, Maki. <laughs> And Maki is really a high-performance uh, plotting library. And actually, I use this to, to visualize my uh, raw data. And uh, yeah, so that, that's what you can, uh, can look at if you want to play with Julia yourself. Now, let's look at the signal. So if you slap on a sensor on your arm, uh, the signals basically look like this. You, when, you, uh, when you relax, there's some background noise. And then when you flex your muscle, like you make a fist, uh, you, can, you get this uh, alternating pattern that gets higher in amplitude and when you relax again, it gets lower. So this is basically the thing we need to detect and classify and, uh, and analyze. And then the thing is, I have a sensor with eight, uh, eight channels. So here's my wife. I will show a quick video. And we can, we can see all the eight different channels uh, for different kind of gestures. I wrote everything down in a blog. So you can uh, go and look over there if you want to know the details. It's uh, actually a blog on the BrainFlow uh, website. Uh, but let's look at the video. Let's see if it works. Then you can see how, what the raw data looks like. Yeah, so you see my wife is making some gestures. And here you see the raw data streaming in the Maki uh, plotting package. And it's pretty high density data. You see every, if you look carefully, you see that every gesture kind of gives a different, unique uh, pattern across the different sensors, right? because every, every gesture basically activates different uh, muscles. Right? So here's the raw data in a, in a static plot. By the way, looking at the data is really fun. Eh? You can look at it for hours, looking at your own uh, personal data. <laughs> so, but, but we want to do some data science, right? So basically, we need to classify this. I've got these gestures, and uh, I want to detect them from the raw data. Now, you as a human, maybe if you look carefully, you can already see some differences. Like, uh, these are the eight channels, right? Like, for example, if you do a, a flex in one direction, it will activate mostly sensors on one of the muscles. And if you flex on the other direction, you see the other uh, sensors activating. So, you know, I, I bet we can do some machine learning on this, right? <laughs> now, a quick intermezzo in Julia, because you are all Python people, right? So you're using pandas a lot. And if you switch to Julia, you're going to use the data frames package. I really, actually, I enjoy the data frames package more than pandas. I think it's more convenient, more, more user friendly. So you can just make a data frame. You just assign it to a, to a column. You can assign afterwards to a column. I like that you can just index things like a matrix. Officially, I used a lot of MATLAB in the past. And this is more like, more like MATLAB, actually. But uh, there's no iLock and that kind of weird things that I always need to look up. And you can also just choose the columns by name. I found you can very easily do group by. And because Julia is really fast, it just gives you a, a pointer to the data. So you can actually mutate the data of the original object just right there. I, I mean, I just uh, love uh, Julia. OK. And then you, this is how a data frame looks like uh, on the REPL. So that's a quick, uh, eh? if you're scared there's no pandas, uh, there's this thing. Then let's go to the machine learning. OK. So you got your data and your pandas and uh, all your matrices. And now we want to do some machine learning. All right, there are a bunch of, again, you know, you're new to Julia, so there are a bunch of uh, machine learning uh, frameworks in Julia. There is uh, Flux. There's also TensorFlow.jl, but Flux is like the pure Julia implementation of the neural networks, so you can just read the source code. Uh, there is, of course, scikit-learn, which just calls uh, the Python package. Yeah, it's very easy, by the way, in Julia to call Python packages. 
There's also MLJ, which is machine learning in Julia. So that's like the overarching uh, integrating framework it seems to become in, uh, in Julia. And basically what it does, it, it, it makes it easy to set up pipelines and do all these kind of experiments that you want to do. And it just calls all the uh, underlying packages. So it can call Flux, it can actually call scikit-learn. And these can also call a lot of the independent packages. So I, li I like in Julia that they didn't integrate everything in one big thing. They, you, can, you can, if you look, want, look at every like decision tree, XJ boost, nearest neighbor, you can look at all of them individually. And these packages basically just give you an integrated interface. So you have the freedom to choose uh, which you prefer. I actually prefer just to get the individual packages. And now I'll show you uh, how I did that. So yeah, again, I really like Julia. If you, you know, and if you want to read the source code, you know, just go do it, right? I mean, I, I've never read the Tensor, TensorFlow source code, but I read the Flux source code. So if you want to see how is a, a loss function implemented in Julia, you just go here to, to Flux, you look for the mean square error, and it's there. Actually, you know, it's, 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 it's embarrassingly simple. You just take the difference, you square it, and you take the aggregation, which is by default the mean, and that's it. I mean, if you want to implement your own loss function, just uh, go ahead, right, do it. It's very easy. I like that. Uh, so we're going to build now a machine uh, learning <laughs> model, right? So this is basically the flow that I built myself. Uh, it always starts by connecting your device, right? You want to get the data with the brain flow. Then what I did, I made a little script. I put it in a package uh, that gathers all the recordings per gesture. So basically for two minutes, I just tell myself to uh, do one gesture all the time. So you get the raw data per gesture and then you, you can label it. Then most of the work actually is always, as you know, in the, all the data engineering and the signal processing, eh, not the machine learning. So I spent a lot of time uh, uh, partitioning all the samples in nice little packages, making them easy for the algorithm to train on, processing the data properly. There's lots of stuff happening uh, over here. But in the end, you've got basically eh, the thing you want to fit, and you've got uh, a big matrix of, of, of samples. Basically, I, I sliced all these little samples out of, uh, out of all, these, uh, all these signals. And then, of course, yeah, you know, machine learning is easy. You just do a fit, right? So, and then you save it. <laughs> yeah. So, base. What I did. I'm not going to show you all the code that I used here. Uh, oh yeah, wait. Oh yeah, but okay, we want to we want to pick an algorithm. Okay. So we in the past already in Python we uh, looked at all the all the algorithms, see how they performed on the data, and if you process your data a bit 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 intelligently, yeah, you can find plenty of algorithms that work pretty well. So what in the end, what I said for my prototype that I'm going to show here today is I just pick a random forest, because the random forest seems to be pretty good, and they're also nice and, uh, and fast. So I just, yeah, I just use that one. So the code, I'm not going to show you all the code, but it roughly looked like this. So I put all my data engineering in a nice little package, which you can install, because you, know, you make your code reusable. I, you also do that, right? You don't just throw scripts over email, yeah? Ah, yes, yes. So I, I, I just slice it. I window it. Yeah, and uh, in the end, when I do the live prediction, basically the the algorithm sees one sample all the time. Yeah. Yeah? So I slice it in exactly the same way as what I want to predict in the end. And I put all the channels behind each other. Yeah, that was the simplest uh, way yeah? because there are. But there might be some time points where it's kind of ambiguous if the movement is either happening or not. Yes, yes. You will see some flickering in the final demonstration. So it definitely things can be improved. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely, but for the prototype, it was all uh, fine. Okay, so I, I I could get pretty good. I mean, there are um, there's a massive ecosystem of academic papers on how to get to 99 percent. Yeah? I I just take the sample, I dump it in the algorithm, I get I can get often yeah 80 to 90 percent uh, accuracy. So it's good enough for me. Okay, as my as a hobby data scientist. <laughs> So that's what I do. I, uh, I, I made a nice little package to, to process all the data. If you want, you can go and read about it. I, I load all these uh, files. And then when I do the training, yeah, I, you can use the whole MLJ, the scikit-learn stuff, but I just use the decision tree. There's also actually, I found out, uh, also you can do uh, cross-validation uh, in there even, and, and check it, look at the accuracy. And then in the end, I just put all the data in the build forest. I get the model. I save it with uh, this JLD2. Julia data serialization. It's like pickle, but again, impure Julia. And then I've got my model, right? 
And then I want to do the thing that is most interesting, most cool to demonstrate. I got to do live predictions, right? Uh, so I, again, I connect my, my, uh, my, 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 my biosensor with Blameflow. I load my model, right? It's very simple. I load it. I, you know, I start my stream. I, with, I use Maki here. I, very simple for this demonstration. I just make a, a text, a block of text, and I will update it uh, continuously. And then I've got a loop where I get the data, I make the prediction, and I update uh, basically the plot. It basically the code looks like this. You know, I get some data with Brainflow. I use my package to process it exactly like during the training. I apply the forest, and then I basically here I can update this Maki node very quickly with uh, with the gesture. And basically you get this video. So here's my hairy arm with the various sensor. Yeah, my arm. And there you see the, this note from Maki and the code. And there we go. Let's see how it works. So I'm making these gestures. You see live. I'm uh, predicting the gestures, right? Uh, and sometimes it flickers a bit, see? So it's not absolutely perfect, but I think it works pretty well, actually. Yeah? <laughs> <laughs> so, so we did it, right? We got the data, we can make predictions. Now the only uh, next step is to actuate something. And for this prototype, the very simplest thing you can do is press a key. Huh? And if you can press a key, you can play a video game. So actually, the next video is immediately uh, clear. I, uh, I got my wife hooked up, and I got her to play a video game. Let's see <laughs> how that looks like. So there's a nice little video game. Here's the sensor. And she's trying to. So a move, when, it, when she squeezes, it's like a jump. And when she moves back and forth, it is just, uh, you know, doing that. Let's see. Oh. <laughs> that's it. <laughs> so that's actually the whole presentation. How long did it take? Yeah. So we got there. Uh, if you want to start playing with the biosensors, uh, well, First, you need to buy one. That's that's the biggest obstacle. But then uh, you can just start using Brainflow. We always need more users. Uh, we definitely need open source contributors. Sponsors and partners are still something we're looking for. And what I'm thinking would be really cool in the Eindhoven area, maybe there are other people with biosensors like me. We could maybe start organizing workshops uh, and hackathons and just lower the threshold uh, to get started with biosensors. Yeah? And if you want to know more, just go ahead and uh, visit Brainflow. That's it. Thanks for being here. Time for questions. I'm going to tour this. Um, hi. So cool stuff. Thanks. The question I have, so uh, one thing about Julia that's kind of nice, has like this JIT compiler. Oh, yeah. Right, so that's awesome. That's great. But then you kind of wonder, well, what if you want to run this on a Raspberry Pi? Do you also need the entire Julia language if you want to? Can you also get like lightweight Docker containers? Ah, well, well, Docker. Yeah, you can Dockerize anything, of course. Uh, but but the reason why people like to use Rust is because you get four megabytes in your Docker container. Yeah, yeah. This is actually an interesting question. We because I'm also pushing uh, Julia at ASML, <laughs> and we want to deploy it on embedded systems. Uh, there's the package compiler which can compile Julia into a standalone library, but the libraries are still a bit big, indeed. Huh? They're like uh, you can get down to 100. 150 megabytes. Yeah, it's better than Python, eh? And definitely better than MATLAB. Yeah. <laughs> so it's uh, actually we're gonna pay uh, Julia Computing. Uh, we're paying them in Julia 1.8. We'll make them smaller, so we'll get down to like 30, 40 megabytes. Yeah. And, and maybe we'll get even better. You know, it's still evolving, and yeah, I, we we can really make this a, the best language on the planet. <laughs> Next question. So this question is a little bit in the other direction. Uh, have you considered calling Julia from Python? I, I heard about these packages that, yeah. that can do just for the parts where you need to speed so that you can still work in Python. And yeah, you can just do that. Yeah. Is there, there any limitation, uh, like any downside to doing that? Uh, I think the data marshalling is going via C, so it's even you can, I think, even pass data in memory to Python. Actually, with C, it's, it's beautiful. The C interface is, is like a native C interface. So between C and Julia is a lot of love, and between actually Julia and Python also a lot of love. 
so I don't, I haven't seen any ba downsides. I mean, yeah, you need two installations. That's the only downside, right? Yeah. You need more dependencies. Uh, yeah. So I like to keep things pure, Julia. Sure. <laughs> we still have time for questions. Okay. <laughs> One, I'm gonna try. Go for it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, pretty good. Yeah. What is the scale of those time series? And I see this kind of like pulsing or like periodic pattern. Ah. Are you repeating the, I, the gesture? Is it like the heart rate? Or no, that's me. That's just me repeating the gesture. Yeah. So this is like a, I, I have here a five second sample from my two minute uh, uh, data collections. Yeah. That's what you're looking at over here. Yeah, that's a good one, actually. Uh, so there, there's plenty of things I can improve here, because indeed, when I uh, when you quickly switch between motions, the, the algorithm I train isn't so good at it, because it basically expects always uh, like a pause, you know, in between the, so always a relaxed motion between in between them. So that's definitely an improvement. Actually, there's many, many improvements we can do. Like if you t turn, take off the device and turn, put it back on, you know, there's also some variation in the sensor data. So yeah. From a robustness point of view, that there, there, there can be many, many uh, improvements uh, in the algorithm, yeah, and in the data processing. Yeah. Thanks. You're maintaining the mic. So maybe you can expand it. Oh, the seat. Uh, I was wondering how well it works if uh, you train the model on the data for one person or for more persons. So ah. if you switch the sensors to a different arm, how well it, will it work? Yeah, it, uh, it'll be worse. <laughs> <laughs> so indeed, it's best to collect a lot of samples from a lot of, uh, already from yourself, from different uh, positions. Yeah, so you, you become more robust against that, indeed from the other arm. And uh, if you indeed across uh, people, I know it works because uh, there, there are there, the, the, the manufacturers of the company. There was a Mayo sensor in the past. I don't know if you know it. it was a startup. They made it, they mass produced it, and they had an algorithm that could work uh, pretty well from uh, human to human. But if you calibrate it on yourself personally, it just gets better, you know. A and also, actually, Facebook is nowadays working on uh, a device. It has like uh, 20 sensors or something, mm. and they really want to use it to control their 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 VR worlds with it. So it is possible, yeah. But I'm not a, I didn't go that far, let's say. Yeah, I saw in the video you were using your own arm and uh, your wife's arm. Yeah. But you can also rotate the sensors and it'll still, uh, you get different uh, training data. I guess. Yeah, 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 it's possible. Yeah, you can train for that, uh, but you need more data. Yeah. So the easiest, if you just want to be quick in a demonstration, like in a workshop, you just uh, do two minute uh, samples and you keep it in place. Yeah. <laughs> then you get like 90% accuracy. That's the best <laughs> demo. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you. Questions? Oh, there's one here. Uh, uh, first, great stuff. Thanks for the introduction on this. Uh, yeah. I actually saw the, let's say the video is actually presented. Like, I'm, ha I'm just like curious. We check if the precision of the arm band can actually have an impact on the final result because it seems like uh, yeah 
Yes, like always, some somewhere like upper ah, elbow. So yes, 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 yes. Because yes. like if you're near the wrist, probably you have like more movements from ligaments and muscles. And yeah. The patterns of the data. Probably. So we need the the the, the, the position yeah, of the exactly. sensor on the arm. You mean? Yeah. That's what you're asking. Yeah, definitely, that makes a lot of difference. So these arm bands, they're like roughly the size on the the optimal position is indeed roughly here. Mm -hmm. That's where you have the strongest signals. Yeah. Indeed. But uh, there are wristbands that also measure here, but you just have lower signals. Yeah? Ah, so those things are always like fixed in this position. It's That's the best position. Uh, ah, okay. stu studied uh, to death by lots of PhDs. Yeah? This, this is the best position for the sensors. But you can measure actually anywhere as a muscle, mm -hmm. you, you can measure these uh, signals. It's just a matter of signal quality uh, versus sensor right. quality. There, there are also like, um, you know, people that don't have an arm. <laughs> yeah? And they, for example, I know one experiment where they chopped up the, m the breast muscle mm -hmm. and put different EMG sensors on the different things, and the, 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 that person learned to control a whole arm with the, by controlling different <laughs> muscles in his chest. Yeah? Not a cord? Oh, okay. So that, that's also possible. Yeah. <laughs> there are many, many, many possibilities. All right, thanks.